So, you want to buy new shoes online. That may seem simple, but what is really happening on the internet when you go out and you type www.shoes.com? What is happening in the background? How does it even work that you can buy shoes online? It may seem simple, but there's a whole infrastructure, a whole world behind that. What is the internet? Two years ago, I was at an internet meeting in South Africa in Durban. And it happened to be that in that week that I was there, it was the birthday of Nelson Mandela. And the custom in South Africa is that on the birthday of Nelson Mandela, you do something for the community. And you do that for 67 minutes because Mandela gave 67 years of his life for South Africa. We went off with a whole busload of people to paint a school in a township with an incredible poverty. I've been traveling quite a lot around this world. I've seen poverty, but this was one of the worst places. And there, there was this school and we were supposed to paint it. We, uh, we came inside, we met the teachers. And of course, this is South Africa. We were 50 people, there were 33 brushes. And um, so the head of the school said, for the other 17 people, do you want to teach for 67 minutes in one of our classes? And I immediately raised my hand, gave my brush to somebody else and said, I want to teach. And there I was in front of a classroom with about 25, 14 year olds. And I was thinking, what shall I teach them about? I wanted to talk about the internet and explain them, what is the internet? And I asked them, do you know the internet? And only three of them raised their hands. They knew what a smartphone was, they didn't have one. They knew what a computer was and the school just had gotten a couple of computers, but no internet. And now try to explain to somebody who hasn't got any idea what the internet is, what it is. That is an incredible difficult thing. The internet is a worldwide network that makes a whole new way of communication possible. The internet consists of autonomous networks that are tied together voluntarily and that makes it possible for you to communicate from the Netherlands to Iceland or to China, wherever you want to go. Whatever you type in is hacked into bits and bytes, sent over six, seven of those autonomous networks, ends up in the destination that you want to, to end up and still arrive there unaltered, intact and useful. It's sort of an organized anarchy. It's a fundamental cornerstone of something that is much more than just for buying shoes. It's an innovation engine that allows us to build on ideas of others and yet others build again on our ideas. And based on that, we innovate much faster than we did before the internet. And we develop new medicines, we develop disaster warning systems. It's a tool to topple very big corporations if we don't like them, or even governments if we don't like them. It's by far the most exciting, inspiring and disruptive space in this world. And I love it. Who am I? I am the guy that runs the internet. But fortunately, I'm not alone. There's thousands of people like me. The internet is run by volunteers, essentially. It all started in the 70s. The Department of Defense of uh, the United States, they asked a couple of universities to develop a communication protocol that they could run fast over whatever infrastructure there was in whatever country they were attacking that day. The universities developed a packet-based system that slowly developed into what we now know as the internet protocol. And the universities themselves started to use that internet protocol and developed all kinds of applications around this. And the developers that did that were raised in, in the 60s and 70s in a kind of altruistic culture. And so whatever they developed around this internet protocol was targeted at communication, at sharing knowledge, more or less with one goal, to make society better and, and even the idealistic idea that we could prevent wars. I myself had the honor of being involved from 1985 onwards. Did I see it coming what the internet has become today? No way. 
In 92, I was chairing a workshop in Zurich. At that point in time, the uh, internet was fully ASCII based, that means character based, no graphic interface. And the, the, the task we had in front of us in the workshop was to create one uniform interface to databases, because any database coupled to the internet at that time required its own commands and stuff. Nobody could use it, let alone my grandmother. So we were required to standardize something. And we were working in this room in Zurich and somebody entered and he introduced himself as Tim Berners-Lee. And he said to me, I have a solution for your problem and I call it the World Wide Web. He showed a command-based interface and we looked at it and we were severely unimpressed. And we said, well, it looks nice. You know, we might adopt some parts of it and maybe it would work, but we didn't see it coming. In fact, I had a fierce discussion with Tim over the weeks after that uh, on what a URL should look like. And I, re I remember us remarking somewhere in the discussion that, you know, it m might even appear on the side of a bus. And we really had to laugh about that. That was hilarious. The fact that the URL would be on the side of a bus. I think it took two years before I saw the first bus with a URL on the side. What we did in that time was create an innovation system, an innovation ecosystem that everybody could use for all kinds of things. It led to permissionless innovation, permissionless innovation. Nobody, you have to ask for permission to innovate on the internet. And almost everything is possible on the internet. It is disruptive, it forces breakthroughs, it affects every single facet of our modern day lives. It creates new business models. Traditional sectors and business models are disrupted. And we've seen that in the music uh, industry, the movies industry, but you also see it in the manufacturing industry with 3D printing. You see it with banks that are threatened by crowdfunding and crowd investments. And you see it in the leisure industry, of course, with Uber and Airbnb. So what's the problem? As we see freedom reduced in many places in the world around us, uh, likewise on the internet. The internet is in serious danger. We are in danger. The open, trustworthy and accessible internet is threatened. Commercial parties are the first that threaten it. The big conglomerates, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, they all gather data on us. They all want to make us use their stuff rather than the internet at large. And they combine all kinds of databases to build an incredible knowledge about our daily lives. Imagine what that will become if Internet of Things breaks through and we start using wearables. If you have the wearables, all kinds of information get uh, online on how you behave, your physical condition, etc. Do we really want corporations to have access to that? Will that add to our freedom? And evidently there's cybercrime. What happens if the internet goes down? How does our society function? Since the Arab Spring, our governments are probably the biggest threat to the freedom on the internet. They, s they started using the internet for tracking and tracing. Tracking and tracing journalists that are opposed to whatever government there is. Tracking and tracing their own citizens, what Russia and China do. Or even go further than that, like the United States does, as Snowden has shown, tracking and tracing everybody in the world. They consciously weaken systems and technologies that we use. They don't report bugs and vulnerabilities that they find. They put <coughs> backdoors into encryption algorithms. SSL, as turned out early March this year, uh, has a huge hole in there which was known way before that, but nobody uh, wanted to report that. There are two things at stake. One is our privacy. We have nothing to hide, of course. That's what they always say. But even if I've got nothing to hide, I don't want you to know that I've nothing to hide. Privacy depends on context. And I might give away a bit of my privacy to this 
uh, application or service and a little bit to that. But I never gave anyone permission to combine those two and create a new context and use it. And context is really important. In 1939, the Dutch kept really nice databases out about people and their religion. And in that context of 1939, it was okay. In 1940, it was no longer okay. We had an invasion here and the Germans took over and those databases were used in a totally different context. Second and even maybe worse, our digital playground is under threat. The whole system weakens and is disruptive if governments uh, start mingling with the technology. If we have an open society, if we value an open society, that has its price. The same way that highways have their price. We like highways, we don't do away with highways, we need highways, but we know that terrorists use highways to transport themselves, but we don't close down the highways. So let's please have the same type of discussion on the internet. Don't close it down because we need the internet to solve the huge societal challenges that we are facing. Aging, scarcity. So what, what can we do about this? The first question is who controls the internet? There's a lot of organizations involved with issues on the internet and, and who, who help it functioning. And these organizations need to be multi-stakeholder. That means everyone who has an interest needs to be represented. That's the only way we can bridge cultural and political differences. So how does a multi-stakeholder process work? It's slow, very much like the Dutch solution we call polderen. Let me give you an example. If we go back to domain names, remember www.shoes.com? Uh, originally, they were ending only in .com, .org and country codes like .nl, .de. Then all of a sudden the commercial parties came along and they demanded their own extensions. .google, .facebook, .shell. I immediately thought this has huge implications and everybody will run for domain names now. So I immediately phoned back home to Surfnet and I said to my colleagues at Surfnet, please register surf.net as soon as possible before anybody else misuses that. What I should have done, of course, was register sex.com, which was sold a year later for one million dollars. <laughs> so if we would have just let that happen, we would have had a technical problem. We would have gone from a hierarchical structured namespace to a flat namespace. We would have had a political problem. Who owns .amazon? The, the book selling company or the people living in the Amazon area. So what we did, we established ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and we um, took a multi-stakeholder approach. We weighed all the interests of all parties, commercial, governments, end users. We defined rules by which you could apply for a new extension, all the while focusing on progress, on innovation. This has led to Amsterdam applying for .amsterdam and in turn TEDx applying for TEDx.amsterdam. So you see a small change in domain name, but it hides a large ecosystem to keep the internet open, fair, accessible, secure and free. And that's absolutely necessary. What we need is a system with transparency accountability. That system still needs to solve the challenges that are really out there that are sometimes misused to shut down the whole internet, but we need to solve cyber criminality, cyber terrorism, child pornography. But most important is that at the same time, we need to keep the internet open, we need to keep the digital playground, we need to keep the permissionless innovation. And that requires the cooperation and participation of all stakeholders. So, finally, what can you do? Don't give up your privacy because of free services or threats of terrorism and child pornography. We need to make sure that the digital playground is fostered by as many people as possible. Not by a sole government, not by Facebook, but as many different people, organizations and governments as possible. And we can do that by participating because we need the combined knowledge of all the people in the world to solve the problems our society is facing. And the internet is the only tool that makes that possible. So let's make sure it stays open, trustworthy, and that it's accessible, 
even at a school in a township in Durban. Thank you very much.